Runs with Courage, Chapter 11, Journey. I walked until the pole star disappeared and the early rays of the sun appeared. I would travel beneath the cover of the night and sleep during the day. My hope was that I had already traveled far before anyone could discover I was missing. In the early light, I could see some outcroppings in the distance of ja or distant jagged cliffs. The teachers at school called these cliffs the Badlands, but my people, uh, but to my people, they were called Mako Sak or Sika. Cousin and I had been frightened of these cliffs until, or legend said, that these were places where the bones of Unkente, the wa a water monster, rested. Some said that they could still hear or still feel her moving there, wanting to knock the cliffs over on people foolish enough to venture inside the valleys of stone. But this time, seeing the cliffs brought me comfort instead of fear. Their appearance meant I was getting closer to my Tio Spa. I found a small grove of trees and put down my pack. Carefully, I made a hiding place out of branches and crawled inside. I opened my bundle and nibbled on one of the muffins. I could feel the chill of air reaching through my clothes. I wrapped myself inside my blanket I had taken from my bed. Suddenly, I was so exhausted I could barely keep my eyes open. I rubbed Mother's Wota... Uh, gently feeling strengthened and fell asleep i awoke to the sounds of coyotes calling to one another in the dark run on run on they seemed to say and i felt renewed courage from their voices my feet had grown numb in in the pinchy shoes i was still wearing my legs felt stiff and sore as i continued to walk even though i had slept soundly i felt tired and achy i thought of my family to distract me from my tired body i could picture bear running through the grasses his restless spirit in constant need of motion there had been times i had grown tired of his endless questions how i looked forward to those questions now mother would be getting ready for the winter moons she would be preparing thread and needle to mend clothing and sleeping skins and other things in need of repair i would join her in this world work using the bone needles I was used to, not the metal needles the whites used, and I would be in the traditional way mother and mother would be proud of my work. Father would be the, with the scouts trying to find game uh, to dry for the winter moons. If we were lucky, they might find a deer or an antelope and provide more food for our Tio Spa than the meager rations we received. Uncle would be meeting with the elders in the council lodge. They would discuss the important happenings in our Tio Spa and would discuss the future and share stories of the past, but then, like an angry thief, memories of school would start taking over my thoughts. Kill the Indian, savage, cut hair, beatings. Instead, I focused on the pole star to clear my head, or studied Maki Sika, uh, cutting jagged outlines into the night. I re or I searched for the sky for other star pictures and kept walking, the path that seemed to stretch forever. And finally, as the sun began to appear in the sky, I saw a faint image of teepees in the distance. I stumbled as I quickened my pace, wanting to run my, uh, to my family, but my people were still far away and my body ached too much to run. Bear was playing outside with cousins when I saw him. I did begin to run. Little brother, I called when I was close enough to be heard. Sister, he cried. He sprinted towards me, but then came to a sudden stop. Sister, your clothes, he whispered, his eyes large. Your hair. Bear, it's me, I cried, holding my arms out to him. I wanted desperately to touch him, but he shook his head. I could see the fear in his eyes. Bear, it is sister, I said. My heart felt as if it might break. I have rabbit you made me. Here it is. I showed it to him, the small carving. It has brought me back to you. He took it and rubbed it. Mother, mother, he called out, dropping the rabbit and running into the teepee. I bent down and picked up the small wooden animal, trying to stop the trembling and ignore the fear that my decision had, or decision to run had been the wrong one. Several of the young cousins stood some distance away, peering at me with wide eyes. I looked down at my white clothes, realizing what they were seeing. A white girl in the midst of their tiaspa, I wanted to rip my clothes off and pull my hair down to make it longer again. Daughter, mother emerged from the teepee flap, and I uh, was in her arms, clinging to her. Forgive me, mother. Please, forgive me, I said over and over again as she stroked my hair. Daughter, she said, touching one of the yellowing bruises on my arm. You have been injured. I am home, mother, I said. I am safe now. She led me inside our teepee, and I stood breathing in the familiar scent of my home. My eyes wandered over the things I had not seen for so long. The hanging pot, or the cooking pot hanging, the sleeping skins rolled up neatly for the day, mother's necessary bag on the small post. 
I started crying and couldn't stop, feeling all the fear and exhaustion pour, uh, pouring out of me. Rest, uh, rest, rest, daughter, mother said, going to cook the fire or the cooking fire and bringing me some warm drink. She bent down and unrolled the sleeping skin across the place where I used to sleep. Shh, she said, covering me with soft skins, and I had finished drinking. I easily fell asleep. I awoke as father and uncle returned in the late afternoon. Mother greeted them first, speaking in hushed tones. I stood up by my sleeping skins, looked down, waiting to be addressed. Daughter, father had said, and uncle nodded. Father, I cried, uncle, forgive me, please, please forgive me. I have failed, I said quietly. Uncle held up his hand. We eat, he said. Our meal was more plentiful than before. I had been taken away. There was soup, as always, watery, with a few vegetables, but there was some meat, enough so that we could ha each have a mouthful. I hope mother hadn't used special reservations for my return. I hope they had not sacrificed because of me. When I finished the meal, I helped mother gather the skin bowls, and we all sat together as a family. I felt or the quiet felt strange. I had grown used to the constant noise of the other girls, and the quiet of my own family felt unfamiliar. Uncle spoke. Tell us of your journey, he said. The story tumbled out of me in a rush of words I hadn't realized was inside. I started at the beginning with my arrival at school and the strangeness of everything. I told them the way of the white people and how they give names freely and that I was not allowed to speak Lakota or say my Lakota name. I spoke of the teachers and the pastor and of trying to learn to be civilized. I explained how I lost I was. I explained how lost and confused I had felt at first until I learned the word bridge and how I had thought I was meant to help build bridges between our people and the whites, but then discovered that teachers at the school weren't interested in bridges. I told of learning that the great white father was the president and that everything that was important to me was wrong at school and that I was called a savage. In a whisper, I told them of the banner Miss Beatrice had unrolled for us and of being asked to get scissors from the office. I wanted to see the, this office because I had never seen... I had never seen one, I said, feeling ashamed to remember how excited I had been. There were many books. I felt proud... Uh, pride to know I could read much of what was there. I had learned many white words, but on the wall there was a small wooden sign. I stopped, looking down, not wanting to continue. The sign was a treasure of Miss Margaret's, I said quietly, starting to cry, and it said, Kill the Indian, save the man. Mother gasped. I've tried not to let my anger strike like lightning. I really have, I said, too ashamed to look at my family, but I was so angry I couldn't control it, and I grabbed the sign and I broke it. I looked down at the bruise on my arm, and I was punished. I paused momentarily, waiting until I had control of my tears. And that was when I realized I could not stay, when I realized the teachers were not interested in helping to, to build a bridge. Finally, there was nothing more left to tell, and I leaned back exhausted. I was relieved to have told my story, but afraid of what uncle and father might say. We will discuss this, Uncle said, looking over at Father, and we'll talk more after that. For now, you must rest, niece. And there was no more speaking then, no more words that needed to be said. Quietly, I crawled beneath my sleeping skins. Even though my head was full of uh, doubt and fear, it was as if I had never been, or it was as if I had never left. I was home. The mother came to me and sat, stroking my hair. I'm sorry they cut your hair, Mother. Or, I'm sorry they cut my hair, Mother, I whispered. I tried to stop them, but I couldn't. Hush now. It's time to sleep, she whispered back. I nodded and fell asleep to the comforting sounds of the family of my family around me.